Well, I'm really honored to be the person to kick off what I think is a very exciting series of trying to make the connections between the, the lab and the clinic and the community. And that really is, if I had to distill it all down, the main reason that I picked up uh, and moved here from Oregon uh, you know, six or seven months ago. I have a really strong desire to take my experience and training in basic science and really start to connect with the clinic. We've talked about that, and you'll see some elements in my work where we've tried to do that. But I think the potential here to do this on this campus is really special, given the fact that we have not only uh, an enormous representation of neuroscientists and behavioral scientists running around this campus, and, and I keep discovering more and more pockets, but um, it's really it's really a quite remarkable opportunity to have the medical school here, the engineering school, and so on and so forth. I'll tell you a little bit um, about the work that we're doing. My work has been very focused on hand and trying to really think hard about um, reaching, grasping, and so on and so forth. Sorry. Sorry. Go on to levels of analysis. We're going to talk about how um, the work that we're doing at the Vic kind of fits into the scope of making this connection between the clinic and basic science. And I'm going to focus mainly on this idea that we can really start to use our tools to bridge the gap between behavior, which plays out at the role of the entire organism, the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, and so forth, and delve deeper into the organization of that central nervous system to start to break it into <coughs> systems, what we might think of as perceptual systems, motor systems, and so forth, and that within those systems, we can probe as far down to the level of maps. Um, the, the advantage that we have with these tools, um, like functional imaging, is that they give us this capability to start to traverse these levels of analysis. And that's where our hope for trying to make connections between neural mechanisms and behavior are really going to start to uh, get knitted together. So the focus of my work that I'm going to tell you about today is trying to think about these cortical representations. And those of you who've studied psychology or studied neuroscience are probably familiar with this very well entrenched idea that within the motor cortex of the brain, you're looking at a left cerebral hemisphere, the motor cortex, precentral gyrus, is represented here in blue, there is a kind of functional map of the body. And that you've got different portions of that motor cortex devoted to controlling the uh, contractions of muscles via their output uh, of different, different uh, body segments. So if we start up here at the longitudinal fissure, there are neurons whose outputs primarily go to the foot and to the trunk of the body. And then as we move more laterally along the surface of that motor cortex, we get into a very large area that's devoted to the representation of the hand. And I want you to tuck that away in your mind uh, because that's going to come up again in the research that I tell you about from my lab. I have a big interest in hand function. Interestingly enough, adjacent to the hand, is another large portion of this map, much more medially located than either the hand or the foot, devoted to the face. So although your hand and your face in terms of actual body <coughs> space are quite far apart, their motor representations are adjacent to one another in these somatotopic maps. Okay. That's an important fact, because when we start thinking about how experience shapes the brain, one of the things that I'll be arguing for is that when you have dysfunction of a hand or loss of a hand, what we see is some intrusion of this face representation <coughs> into that former hand territory, that there's a kind of reorganization taking place. We've known about this somatotopy for uh, a very long time. In fact, the earliest studies in, in, in animal models were uh, done back in the 1870s. And I would say that the biggest discoveries that we've made about this organization over the last 30 years has been how it's shaped by experience, its pliability. And I think that as clinicians, one way to think about some of the work that you're doing is trying to develop ways of structuring a patient's experience, structuring their environment in a way that's going to be most effective 
for driving reorganizational changes. The flip side of that is that if you have a brain injury, or you have a spinal cord injury, or you have, as I'll be talking about, damage to the peripheral nervous system, the extreme case being an amputation, these maps are also going to reorganize. Mm -hmm. The thing I'd like you to, to take away from this is this notion that these maps are maintained. Their integrity, the boundaries of these maps are maintained by experience. They're maintained by a kind of competitive interaction. And if you can alter that by increasing stimulation through training, through rehabilitation, or you can alter it by the kinds of things that happen with bodily injuries or central nervous system injuries. And those are going to have consequences for that brain. So let's talk a little bit about how we can study those kind of maps non-invasively. And that's one of the exciting things that we're able to do at the Brain Imaging Center. Uh, we're able to use fMRI, or functional magnetic resonance imaging, to map activity in the brain in a non-invasive way, in a way that doesn't involve any ionizing radiation like PET scanning or CAT scanning. And that's important because it allows us to be able to take measurements in individuals over time and look at how things change with experience. Very important part of what we're interested in doing in making that connection between basic research and the clinic. This graph, I admit, is a little bit hard to see, but bear with me. Uh, it's a way of sort of organizing the various techniques that we have to study the nervous system in time and in space. Along the vertical axis, this is space. And it's going from very small units of space, kind of down at those levels of individual neurons and synapses and so on down here, up to the entire brain, say, the entire spinal cord. Okay, Very low kind of <coughs> spatial resolution. On the horizontal axis, we've got time going from the scale of milliseconds, right? That, that uh, thousandth of a second kind of unit of time that we think of those individual neurons communicating with one another on, all the way out to years. And the reason we have years here is because some of our tools, broadly stated, for looking at the nervous system play out really slowly. We can, for example, as neuropsychologists, look at what's the consequence of a brain lesion for behavior and how does that play out over time. Well, that's a manipulation that doesn't have a lot of temporal specificity, right? It's, uh, patients certainly change over time, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not a precise way of determining how the system is functioning in time. So we've got that represented out here. And it's not particularly precise typically, right, because lesions are big and they happen to occur uh, where they occur. They're kind of nature's experiments in some way because of the way the vasculature of the brain is structured. Uh, it's occurring on, you know, 10 centimeters or multiple centimeters of organization. What we would love to have is a non-invasive tool, a non-invasive technique that would allow us to very precisely localize activity in the brain, non-invasively, right, in time and in space. And that will be represented down here in this corner. And we simply <coughs> don't have that. At this point in history, we lack that kind of tool. The best uh, tool that we have for compromising uh, in time and space at this point is functional MRI. Okay? It allows us to see activity down to the scale of, let's say, millimeter or multiple millimeters in space. Uh, but the temporal resolution <coughs> is not all that great. And that's because we're not looking directly at the neural activity, but we're looking at changes in blood oxygenation that accompany that activity. We can do that, and I'm going to return to that point in a minute, we can do that by using this machine. And there's really not anything special about that machine. Uh, if you go over to the radiology department, or you can go over to an, an outpatient uh, MR clinic if you've had any kind of a scan, this thing looks pretty typical. The machine that we have in the BIC is a typical clinical scanner, save for one point. It's uh, got a very strong magnetic field. A typical clinical scanner is 1.5 Tesla often. Uh, this is a three Tesla mis machine, meaning that this big magnet that we're using is 30,000 times the strength of the Earth's magnetic field. It's a very, very powerful magnet. And it turns out that that really benefits this functional MRI work 
that constitutes uh, a large portion of all of the research that we do. So what is this functional MRI? How does it work, right? I was saying to you that you can't really look at uh, neural activity directly with functional MRI, but what you can do is look at the consequences in the vasculature system surrounding those neurons. So when you or I, uh, let's say, are opening and closing our right hand, Contralateral to that right hand, that sensory motor cortex is much more active than it is when you're doing nothing, let's say, or when you're doing this with your opposite hand, right? Because we've got this wonderful cross or contralateral organization to the system. Well, what happens uh, in terms of the, the neural activity is that we get an accompanying change in the ratio of oxygenated to deoxygenated hemoglobin, blood. Our vasculature system, those little capillaries that carry that blood uh, to, the, to uh, those neural networks that we're working on, is adapting very rapidly to these kinds of changes in activity. And what we get is an initial extraction of oxygenation, oxygenated blood, so we've got sort of more metabolic activity in the neurons, and we're metabolizing glucose, and, and we're using up more oxygen, so there's a local change in the ratio of oxygenated to, hemo, uh, to uh, deoxygenated blood. And then the, the vascular system dilates a little bit in those capillaries, and there's a super uh, uh, compensation. There's a, a bunch of oxygenation uh, of oxygenated blood pouring into that region, essentially. And that's what's creating that signal that we're measuring. We're, we're looking at the differential changes in those local regions relative to uh, other areas of the brain and how they correlate with behavior. I alluded a moment ago to the idea that this is slow, right? It is slow. What we'd like to do is see activity on the level of milliseconds. This is allowing us to see these changes play out in seconds because we're not observing directly the neural activity. But it's the best compromise we have at the time. So going back now to this notion of somatotopy, uh, one of the fairly simple things that we've done in the lab is to use this bold or blood oxygen level dependent functional MRI to make maps of what's the typical organization of the representations, uh, sensory motor representations of say the hands, the feet, and the face. You looked at a kind of cartoon of that a moment ago, but we can do this in a bunch of individuals and we can uh, use some tricks of computer uh, graphics to organize the data in such a way that we can pool across individuals, we can normalize all their brains into the same space, and what we, we can do is identify the typical organization across a bunch of individuals of these functional maps. So uh, if you think about this as kind of an aerial view, right, you're looking down on the brain, there's an axial slice at the top of the head, forehead, back of the head, the green and the red represent uh, representations of areas that are increasing their activity during movements of the left or right foot. And again, contralateral organization. So right hemisphere is increasing when the left foot is moving, and opposite for the opposite hemisphere. If we move out, and notice how they're right along the longitudinal fissure, where we think they should be, based on uh, these other techniques that have been used to do this mapping previously. If we move more laterally, we can map out the typical areas of the cortex <coughs> in which the hand movements are represented. And you can see this, these areas as well on this coronal slice, kind of slicing right down through the motor cortex here, right? You can see the deep structures of the brain and brainstem. And then finally, we can move a little forward in our coronal plane, and you can see these bilateral representations in purple that are associated if we ask people to clench their face, so kind of moving the lips, right? We can map that face representation, and that's even more laterally located than those hand representations. So the tool is a valid tool, and it's a reliable tool for doing a variety of things. Perhaps some of the simplest things are just mapping out the normal somatotopy. These are just to show you uh, some representations of uh, areas of the cerebellum, that, that also can be mapped with this kind of technique in association with these particular movements. And in some ways, as I'm saying, these are kind of like simple, very simple uses of this technique. 
So now let's take this to patients and see if we can ask some interesting questions. I have a long-standing interest uh, in amputation and how damage to the peripheral nervous system impacts the organization of these cortical maps in the central nervous system. The reason that I'm interested in amputation as from a basic science perspective is it provides a window into how does the organization of the brain change when one uh, undergoes a substantial reduction of stimulation. You lose a hand, there's not sensory information coming in from that hand anymore. There's not efferent or motor output going to the muscles that are now missing as a result of losing that hand. How does the cortex change? How does the cortex adapt as a result of that kind of manipulation of experience? Now one of the ways we can ask that is we can say, what happens to that former hand territory in sensory motor cortex, right? How does that, what happens to that tissue? How does it change? So this is data from uh, 17 right hand amputees and matched controls. Our yoked controls are matched on hand dominance, age, and gender. And again, incredibly simple experiment. They're just given an auditory pacing tone they're told to keep their eyes closed and just purse their lips. <coughs> just move their lips and pace with that tone. That's an incredibly simple experiment. And what you get, as you would expect based on what I just showed you, are these bilateral sensory motor responses quite uh, laterally located in the cerebral cortex. Bilateral because both sides of the face are moving together. Right? They happen to be quite yoked. It's hard to move one side of your face independently. You see that for the amputees, you see that for the controls, and you also see some midline supplementary motor activity that I won't delve into more. But what's interesting is if you do a statistical comparison between these results from the controls and the amputees, what you find is that the amputees are activating substantially more in the hemisphere opposite the hand that's been amputated. Why might that be? Well, one idea is that this map of the face has pushed its way into that former sensory motor hand territory, right? And we'll, we'll, we'll consider this in a second. So there's a kind of evidence from this suggestive of an in, within hemisphere reorganization of these maps. What's interesting is if we undertake another experiment, <coughs> very similar to the first one, and we tell people, we want you just to move your intact hand. So in the case of our right hand amputees, their left hand, just move it in pace with this pacing tone. Incredibly simple task again, right? And we do this for controls, and we do this for amputees. Uh, what we see is really striking, right? Controls show a very substantial increase in activity in that hand representation, contralateral to the hand that's moving. And I should point out that these are organized in a, in a oriented radiologically. So radiologists like to see the left hemisphere on the right and the right hemisphere on the left. And that's how I've kind of presented this data here. So you see a little R in the corner to keep you oriented. Over here in the right cerebral hemisphere, there's a significant increase in activity when our control patients, people like you and I, move their left hand. Nothing ground shattering or earth, earth shattering there. Uh, but what is quite surprising is how different amputees are, right? So these are chronic amputees. They've lost their hand uh, some, uh, somewhere around two decades on average prior to our experiments. And what they show is a stunningly bilateral increase in activity in the brain when they move that intact hand, right? I love this finding because a lot of the findings in my lab, when I go home all excited about them and I want to show them to my wife and show them to my kids, I say, look at the differences, right? And they look at them and they're like, oh, okay, Dad. They humor me, which is nice. Right? Uh, but, you know, this is the kind of result that you can show anyone on the street. You can say, do those images look like those images? And, of course, the answer is no. So if you do the statistical comparison, because as scientists we have to also do the statistics to just show that in fact this isn't due to chance, uh, of course what you see is that 
amputees are significantly activating over in the hemisphere on the same side as the left hand that they're moving, the side opposite the amputation when they're moving that left hand. They're activating both sides of the brain. Right? And that's very different from our controls. So why? Why might that be? Well, one idea that's kind of an old idea is that when you have a deafferenting injury, you, take a, you lose a hand, right? you have a peripheral nerve injury on one side of the body, that changes those maps, and I think we see some evidence for that in both, uh, both of, of these data sets, right? You change that, <coughs> that uh, former hand representation. It's no longer organized in the same way that it was, right? It's now appearing that there's some intrusion of the face representation into that former hand area, and furthermore, it's being recruited when you move the, the intact hand, right? Maybe what's happening is you've changed the balance that naturally exists between these two cerebral hemispheres, uh, which happens to be a kind of inhibitory balance. Right? You've got this corpus callosum connecting those two uh, cerebral hemispheres that has, let's say, roughly 100 million transcallosal neurons that carry information between those two cerebral hemispheres. There's a natural balance that's maintained by inhibition between those hemispheres. And when you take away activity in this hemisphere through the loss of a hand, maybe you disrupt that balance. And now information is flowing when you move that left hand, right hemisphere activates, and that activity pushes over into the left hemisphere. That kind of an explanation is a purely physiological one. And I want to distinguish that from an explanation that might suggest that this has some functional relevance, right? It's possible to have this kind of change in interhemispheric inhibition, but if it doesn't really relate to behavior in any interesting way, I'm not that interested because I'm not a physiologist. I want to know how physiology relates to function, right? So we started to look a little bit closer at this question recently to say, is it really just this kind of physiological rebalancing or is it something perhaps to do with the fact that when you lose a hand, you're now forced right, to use this hand exclusively? I like to think about it as sort of the ultimate constraint-induced manipulation. We hear a lot in rehab about constraint-induced movement therapy, and it works for certain stroke patients and not so well for others, right? And there's a lot of debate about the mechanisms through which it works and for whom it should work and so forth. Well, amputees provide a kind of naturalistic, real-world experiment in constraint-induced therapy. And they don't go home and practice with the other hand, right? We've, we've done things with undergrads where we try to get them to use their non-dominant hand. And so, on and so, so what we, we got interested in was uh, handwriting. We tried to think of a really unimanual skill, something that you and I do with our dominant hand exclusively and handwriting immediately comes to mind, right? As someone who's interested in laterality and handedness over the years, I mean, handwriting is like our most consistently lateralized skill. So we asked, what happens if you lose your right dominant hand behaviorally in terms of handwriting, right? Now you're forced to transfer that skill or to relearn that skill with your non-dominant hand. How good can you get? So we came up, we first pawed through the literature. This is a great example of a question you would think you could just go get a tool and ask it, right? There must be tools out there that allow you to characterize the accuracy of handwriting. I'd love to hear from you if you, if you know of one. Um, what we ended up doing was uh, deciding that we had to come up with something on our own. And what we came up with, my postdoc Ben Phillip and I, is uh, a set of figures that look like this, right? And these, there's a little exemplar up here, sort of instructing subjects what to do. But the idea was there was a starting point. You can't see it because their dots didn't really show up on this figure, but you'll have to trust me. There's a dot in here, and you have to follow a path. You have to connect the dots, like those kind of drawings we all did as kids. And we varied the length of the paths, and we varied, as good experimental psychologists, right, we varied the width of the paths, so we, we changed their accuracy. 
And yes, those things matter. People go slower when the path is longer, as you would expect, and they go slower when the path is narrower. But if we look across all of those manipulations, what we find is something I think that's quite striking. What we find is that in comparison to right-hand age, gender, matched controls, our amputees who were right-handed and lost their right hand perform as well with their left hand as those controls do with their right hand. Those controls are our best estimate of how those amputees would have performed prior to the limb loss. But of course, we don't study amputees prior to their limb loss, right? It's not the case that people are coming in and saying, you know, have a elective uh, amputation. That does occur sometimes, uh, but it's very rare. And of course, the limb has to be severely compromised for that to happen. So the best we can do is kind of between groups comparison. But I find this entirely striking. Speed of accurate performance, which is represented here on the y-axis, for the amputees is as good as it is using their, their left hand, their, their non-dominant hand, as for the controls using their dominant right. And of course, both are better than the controls using their left hand. Right? So now let's go back to the physiology. Let's go back to the imaging. Let's go back to that idea that when an amputee uses their intact left hand, because we're talking about these right-hand amputees. Oh, and I should say that in this experiment, we had seven right-hand amputees. On average, they were almost three decades out. So this is really chronic forced use, right? lot of variants. You have to take who you can get in these studies. It's, it's, messy, uh, it's messy work. Let's go back and ask this question. When amputees and controls are doing this precision drawing task with the left hand, are the amputees making use of the former right hand's representation in the cortex, right? So again, crossed organization. So you and I use our left hand, we should mainly activate over here, right? Amputees activating both sides, and we want to know if the activation over here, on the same side as the hand they're using, has any functional significance. And have to be careful here, because we don't have a ton of data points, right? We only have eight of these uh, dominant hand loss amputees in this project. But it looks like the signal within the former hand area is showing an increase that, that is linear in relation to their normalized speed of performance on that drawing task, on that hand use task. In the amputees here in blue, but in our controls represented here in red, there's nothing. There's no relationship. So we're working on an idea here. And the idea is that this kind of bilateral activity that we see when it, in chronic amputees use their intact hand isn't just simply uh, a physiological change, but that this physiological change also has <coughs> functional relevance, right? It would appear that they're co-opting that former hand territory to help support performance of that hand. And if people are interested in that, I'd love to talk with you more. Um, there, there are ways to sort of frame these ideas in terms of theories about hemispheric specialization. <coughs> Do you have a question? They just do some sort of gross movement. In other words, are they activating that opposite side, or I guess the same side more if they're doing a fine movement, like writing, than if they're doing a gross movement? It's to the best of our work, and we've done upper, uh, above elbow sorts of movements, so like biceps and so on. Um, this is really seeming to be playing out with this more distal sort of movement. It's a great question. I think we could do a better job of, of looking at that, but it seems to be this precision, visually guided precision movement. Yes? Um, so, one is the, uh, you know, the movement is efficient here. What about perhaps it's an active athletes? Perhaps yeah. they are emerging and getting stronger with use because now, um, you know, that hand, you know, the contract, I mean, it's used for the yeah, yeah. for what the previous use is not there. So obviously, if that is the case, it would fine tune better, and that's why your correlation is higher. Yeah, I think that's one one possible explanation here. And so we have some work to do to test it. So you have, I've been emphasizing this cross nature of distal control, right? And that's true for about let's just pick a number and say ninety percent of the fibers cross, and maybe ten percent 
are uncrossed. And the question that Dr. Iyer is raising is, well, maybe they're amputees as a result of, of these changes, perhaps related to experiential practice, as well as this sort of uh, imbalance that's created when you lose the hand, are able to make better use of those ipsilateral pathways. And that's one model that could explain our results. So we're working really hard in figuring out how to test between that model and one that depends entirely on this sort of trains collosum. Mm -hmm. So, so if I were to test it, mm -hmm. so what I would want to know is have you looked at doing other fine tasks with the hand, other than handwriting? Yep. Perhaps in the FMR, in the in the magnet itself. Mm -hmm. uh, have you done any? So, so. So your, your reason is because you would, you would do this because the idea is that handwriting is something that's going to show a lot of experience dependent change, but you're thinking maybe these wouldn't? Other things? Oh, well, no, no, no. Uh, the reason why I would like to do <coughs> other tasks is because handwriting is not the only task sure. which calls upon fine motor. There are other... Oh, of course. We chose it because it's a task that in a healthy adult is... Uh, very, very unilateral. Right. And the other is, what if you inhibit the uh, ipsilateral cortex? If you inhibit the ipsilateral cortex, that yes. is the handwriting. Yeah. And that experiment's actually set up. Yeah. So I'm going to, it would be nice to talk after, but I'm going to have to move on. But yes, it would be fun to talk with you about, about those ideas. Okay. So, was there another question? Or? Okay. Well, Okay, so let's think a little bit now uh, about something that is uh, getting a lot of attention in the rehab world that comes out of the basic science realm, and that is the use of a mirror box. So some of you are, are familiar with this concept of you place a midline mirror, you, you, if you have a patient with, a, with some kind of unilateral impairment, orthopedic, peripheral nerve, central, you have them move their intact hand in front of the mirror, and then the idea is, depending on their level of, of functionality with the impaired side, they can try to follow along with the impaired side, they can imagine movements with the impaired side, and so on. And that this may have some kind of way of reactivating that former hand representation by bootstrapping things with this visual image. Okay? It's a really interesting idea, and it's one that's gotten an enormous amount of attention uh, in, in the literature on amputees, and it kind of made its way uh, somewhat into stroke, although the results are quite mixed. We asked a very basic science question, and that is, is there any evidence that if we set this kind of mirror box stimulus up in the setting of functional MRI, that people actually do activate that former hand territory? And people, I'm, I'm talking about amputees with whom uh, the, the original mirror, mirror box sort of studies were done. And this is a, a, it's a representation of a kind of more complex experiment to pull off in functional MRI, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to show it to you. But it also is relevant to our thinking about how the kind of therapeutic interventions that we might engage in uh, are supported or not supported by actual empirical data. Right? So it's a step in trying to move in that direction. And it's a limited step in moving in that direction, as you'll see. <coughs> so this is the kind of rig that we had to come up with. This was done back in Oregon. But basically, uh, here is a mirror on the individual's lap. This is a healthy control subject, a graduate student who were you know, frequently put through all manners of, of torture in the lab to produce uh, preliminary data. She moves her left hand, it reflects off the surface of this mirror onto this mirror, and then we have a video camera that captures this image, right? And so if she moves her left hand, in this reflection she sees this, right? Even though she's not moving the right hand. The right hand stays perfectly still. And then what she sees is a kind of piped in to this MRI, this little screen that they're able to look at when they're in there, this image that gives the illusion that both hands are moving when only one is. Okay? It's a very simple conceptually complete pain in the neck technique. 
This also allows me to point out one of the nice things about being, I guess, kind of like a dry neuroscientist, right? We don't, you know, put on rubber gloves and lab coats and stuff like that. We work with digital data, and digital data has a lot of really nice properties, uh, some of which is that we can rely on very smart people who work in image analysis to help us develop better tools and techniques. One of which is to be able to unfold the cerebral cortex to get a better idea of where we're at. And I kind of represented you know, a big left hemisphere here with all its folds. And uh, you know, a rough estimate would be that about 70% of that cortical surface is down within those sulci, right? And those fissures. So a lot of what we're interested in seeing in terms of the surface of the cortex is not immediately apparent when you just look at it, right? That's a problem. Uh, but it's, it's nice that we have these brilliant people out there that can figure out solutions for how we can solve that problem by basically opening or unfolding that data, right? And that's what you're seeing here, kind of less folded version of the cortex, as though we were able to pump it up with a bicycle pump and push things out to the surface. And then finally, we can do what we used to do, you know, I think, the surprise, my kids didn't do this, but it's like I did this in school, and I still remember, cartography, right? You take an orange and you have to cut the orange peel to make it flat. We can do that with digital data, and we can flatten out the surface of the cortex and it looks really weird, and it's hard to be oriented. But we can see activity in this left hemisphere associated with right hand movement down in the central sulcus, where it should be. You can see it better when we inflate the cortex, and you can see it really great when we play the cartography game, the orange peel game, and flatten it out. And that turns out to be important for our experiment. So let me describe just quickly the four conditions in this study. In one condition, we throw a blanket over the mirror, basically, and we say, uh, what we want you to do is simply move uh, your right hand, okay? And you make those movements, and we have an auditory pacing cue that keeps, keeps you making them, and, and you're moving along at a, in a nice, consistent rate. And uh, then in the second condition, we say, what we'd like you to do is to move that hand and imagine that the left hand is going along with it. Okay. The mirror is still covered up. So now we've got movement of one hand and imagining the other one is doing the same thing it's doing. And then we can flip the cover off the mirror and we can say, okay, we don't want you to imagine that the, the stationary hand is, is moving anymore. Just forget about it. Move your hand, look at the reflection, right? You're getting this bilateral visual feedback along with the movement. And then we can do the kind of full Monty condition where we, um, it, where we uncover the mirror, we have you move the, the, the intact hand and imagine the, the uh, impaired hand moving along. What's important here is that when we do this experiment in controls and in amputees, we get strikingly different results. In blue, what I've done here is uh, outline the normal hand representation. And we've defined that in the ways that, that I showed you earlier. Just having somebody move the single hand, <coughs> mapping out across a bunch of individuals, what is the typical area of cortex that's activated? So we'll take that to be the functional, no, functionally normative hand representation in sensory motor cortex. If we, if we look at controls, most of the action is happening contralateral to the hand that's actually moving. But if we look at amputees, of course, as you've seen earlier, you should expect they're activating both sides of the brain. So if we compare those guys, the result is what we get here. These are the difference between controls and amputees. Where are amputees activating more than controls um, across these four conditions? And what you see is when amputees move their intact hand on the same side of the brain as the hand they're moving, unlike controls, they're activating that former hand territory quite a lot, right? And we kind of suspected that based on all the stuff I just showed you. If we have them imagine the hand that they don't have, right, maybe that gives a boost to activity in that former hand territory. So they move the intact hand, they imagine that, that hand going along with it, and we get an expansion of that representation. It activates the former hand territory, and it also starts to move beyond the boundaries of that. So a big robust activation. I'll show you the amplitude of the signals in a minute. If we cover up the mirror, uh, or if we uncover the mirror, right, because these two conditions were with the mirror covered, 
Not so much. We take imagery away and things look pretty much the same as they do when they simply move the intact hand. The mirror isn't really doing very much in the former hand territory. And of course, if we do everything, we add imagery back in with the mirror and they're moving the good hand, things look pretty much the same way that they do when they're just moving and imagining. Another way of looking at this is to just pull the data out from the former normative hand territory and say, what's going on? And I'm going to just very quickly say, in all four of our experimental conditions represented in these different colors, of course, amputees and controls activate the hand representation opposite the hand that's moving, right? There's nothing exciting there. What is different, though, is ipsilateral to the hand that's moving, right? When controls engage in any of those four conditions, there's not much going on relative to zero, which is just doing nothing, no, no moving at all, just re relaxing. Amputees show a very robust activity in that former hand territory, right, as I just showed you, and that's augmented in the two conditions that involve imagery, regardless of whether the mirror is there or not. Okay? So one interpretation of this is that, you know, the mirror may be a really good intervention for activating certain structures of the brain, and in fact it does. It activates a lot of the sensory structures of the brain that are involved in processing visual information, as you would expect. But it's not, if the goal is to drive that hand representation, where that ampu now amputated hand would have been uh, represented, right, as has been uh, sort of thought, as it's been thought about the literature uh, as an intervention for, it's not doing a terrifically compelling job. This study is really limited though, right? Because we didn't do a training session with these people. You know, we taught them the task and so forth, but we didn't have them do this intervention over a month or two months or so on. And that's an important limitation that I think really needs to get sorted out. But at least from our perspective, we can say uh, mere exposure to the mirror, right? And use of the mirror as a feedback device isn't really doing much in that former sensory hand territory. It may change with, uh, with practice. Yes? What about the converse? If you actually passively move the extremity? Yeah. It's super hard to do, and we <laughs> thought about it. Um, you know, I like to run, and occasionally, uh, being an old runner, I get all sorts of aches and pains, and I'll go and have somebody work on my muscles, and they'll say, just let your leg relax, right? Just let me take the weight of your leg or whatever it is. And you know how hard that is, right? It's extremely hard to induce passive movement and in, in, in not get some kind of efferent uh, tension in the muscles to really purely do it. And of course, unless we can purely do it, it's contaminated. It's very difficult to do. We could do things like uh, temporarily uh, deafferent and deafferent <coughs> the limb by blood pressure cuffing the arm for 30 minutes, right? You can do an ischemic nerve block. Um, it's uncomfortable. People don't like it. And we thought about it, but we haven't pursued it. What we'd like to do is a, is a little... So you, you're thinking that if you're getting that proprioceptive feedback through that passive movement, that that might be even more important than issuing that command. And that's possible, right? Um, because that's lacking. And of course, in the amputees, so you're thinking with a healthy hand that you would do that. Yeah, but also in someone who's paralytic. Yeah, like a stroke what patient. You, yeah. yeah. What could you achieve? You know, yeah. would that be a form of training or retraining? Yeah. Um, it's possible. It's possible. Um, I'm, I, I, yeah. Does just imagining alone, does that do anything? Yeah, so, um, right, so if you don't move the other hand, you just lay in the magnet and you imagine, and we've done a lot of that stuff. Um, and if I did a little review on that literature a while back. Basically, the, the, uh, it's incredibly inconsistent. And it's inconsistent for reasons that aren't always clear. So actually recording electromyographic activity in the MRI, making sure that they're not doing sort of like uh, small contractions of mo movements that you just can't see. We videotape them to say, you know, make sure they're compliant. But it's very hard to rule that out. And so I think that needs to be part of those studies. What you see when you look across those studies is imagery is something we've looked a lot at in the lab, drives a lot of the higher level premotor, parietal, supplementary motor, basal ganglia, cerebellum sorts of structures, that whole broad extended sensory motor system but not so much primary motor. Um, it varies from individual to individual and study to study, but it's pretty unreliable.
Yeah, I'll take one more quick question, but then I'll, I'd like to. So this, but this was an acute study, right? So the changes with. Acute study, acute that's means, right. When I say acute, means short term middle training. That's right. So maybe the changes are not enough produce changes in your Exactly, right, and that's, that's exactly right. And as I was saying, I mean, th that's a major limitation of our study, right? Maybe if we did this as a, as a, as a sort of intervention over time, oh. we would see something. Oh, not necessarily, I mean, that Pasquale study where they did the division, blocking the vision and then teaching. So even if you did it for, say, four hours or eight hours, mm. it doesn't matter. Hard to get people to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, can I have just a couple more minutes? Is that okay, or, we, or should we stop and take more questions? Because I can either do that, or we can we can go ahead. It's up to you. Um, let's go on a couple more minutes, okay. and then yeah, then yeah. We, I'll move through this pretty quickly. So um, I was saying that my interest in amputees uh, is one of, of a kind of a basic scientist perspective, and I think they provide a very interesting window into experience-dependent changes in the brain. And of course, as clinicians, what you'd like to also know is whether some kind of interventions, whether it's a mirror box or imagery or some kind of rehabilitation that you might undertake with somebody who still perhaps has a limb, is going gonna, is gonna to reverse those kinds of plasticity changes. So I think of the amputees as kind of like a pure form of manipulating experience to change the central nervous system without the complications of brain lesions, which are really tough to grapple with and to come up with samples and that you can compare across people and so on. Uh, the question of reversibility is where we really like to go, but how do you reverse an amputation? Well, it turns out you can reverse an amputation, and it's, done, uh, it's been done about 50 times across the world. And I have an active collaboration with a group in Louisville who's done the largest number of these patients, eight to date, uh, of uh, allergenic hand transplants, right? So uh, the first hand transplant was actually done uh, back in 1964, one year before I was born. And it was a remarkable failure because people didn't have the sort of immunosuppressive uh, regimens in place necessary to deal with this kind of thing. Uh, so it's not surprising. I mean, this even predated cyclosporin. The patients that we've been working with are a series of patients starting in, in the late 90s and uh, continuing into this day. And uh, they provide a really interesting comparison point relative to our amputees to ask the question of whether these kinds of changes we've been seeing in the cortex might reverse. So these are two patients, uh, and I'll just uh, quickly go through this because you're experts now in thinking about sensory motor organization and how we look at it with fMRI. In red is data from the transplanted hands. We've got patient MS. He's the world's first successful unilateral hand transplant recipient. We saw him 10 years out. He's uh, able to pick up small objects. He's got sensitivity in the individual digits. And he can localize light touch without vision within about 8 millimeters, so under a centimeter. It's a really remarkable recovery. If we stimulate his left hand, uh, again, these are radiologically oriented, in the, left hem in the right hemisphere, you get a very nice, robust activation. But like our amputees, he still shows somewhat of a, a, a large ipsilateral increase that uh, was interesting to us. Because one way to think about these patients is, does the brain go back to looking like a control subject, or does it show some residual evidence of continuing to look like an amputee? Does he show that bilateral activation when he moves that amputated left hand? And the answer is sort of, right? He sort of looks like somewhere in between an amputee and a control, even after 10 years. The problem with this story is that look at what happens here, right? So he's got, he's got this effect here, and then our amputees whopping effects when they use uh, bilateral when, when they use their uh, intact hand, the hand that's not been affected, and he's still showing those in, in spades uh, after you know 10 years out from the surgery. Our other patient, uh, right hand transplant, four months out, and you can see that this is like catch-as-catch-can work, right? Poorly matched, very difficult to compare between these patients. One lost his left, one lost his right. This guy was left-handed, this guy was right. At least they both lost their dominant hand showing a pattern that looks more typical of what we might expect in control subjects only four months out from the surgery. 
So this is just a, a hint of how we're, how we're trying to move in the direction of thinking about one way of, of uh, asking the question of are long-term chronic changes in functional organization of the cortex reversible if you can restore that flow of sensory motor information between the hand and the brain. So I'm going to stop there. I want to thank you for your time um, and to just acknowledge the participants uh, who worked, uh, uh, participated in the research with me. These two are back at Oregon. Uh, the student is finishing his PhD in biology next week. And this is the group that moved with me and myself uh, here to Oregon, uh, four postdocs and, and a couple technical people. And then this is a collaborator back at Oregon. Thank you for your time. Time for a few more questions. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll When, in thinking about the left hand uh, amputee that you just showed here at the end, yeah. um, depending on the age, left handed dominant people tend to be forced to use their right yeah. hand more. And so, a study of the loss of a left hand dominant um, for comparison would be really interesting. Yeah, and we're trying to do that. So we're, we're, and I would appreciate anyone who has great suggestions about how to help us out with this. The folks, collaborators at Rusk Rehab have been very helpful in putting us in touch with the local uh, prosthetics and orthotics community. We're on an effort to recruit as many upper extremity amputees as we can from the sort of central uh, Midwest. And hopefully we'll be able to get into those kind of questions. And we need big sample sizes, right? I mean, a lot of the studies that I showed you you know, or, or teetering on the edge of being somewhat less powered than I would like them to be. And that's part of the trick and difficulty of clinical research. But that, that's a great question. Right now, we're taking people who are left-handed undergrads who are happy to come down and, and do things for us. And we're seeing how good can they get with that left hand over serially training them over time. And then looking to try to track the neural mechanisms that might contribute to that in healthy adults as a way of starting this process. Yeah, it's a great point. Thank you. Jack? Yeah, this, this, I, I don't know that this is even doable, because um, I understand the, the population constraints, but I mean, is there, are there developmental studies? As a developmentalist, I'm just interested in, like, after an, an amputee, like, following them on this handwriting task, uh, I mean, I don't know if it's possible. Yeah. Are, are there studies that kind of show how long it takes to, you know, acquire this skill in the ipsilateral, um, sensory motor cortex. Yeah. Uh, and like a time a timeline of learning and and how does that compare with just in a nor in a typically developing child learning this skill? Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, um, like how does that comparisons around that? I don't even know if that's possible to do. No, I mean it's a great it th these are exactly the kinds of questions that I think are really interesting. So um, let, me, let me frame this a little bit differently. We've done all these kind of acute studies, right? As, as you pointed out, I mean, they're one slice in time. And there's enormous individual variability, right? Is that <clears throat> informative or is that noise? And that's the question that the scientist grapples with all the time. And so there was a bifurcation in the history of experimental psychology where uh, you had the sort of experimental psychologists veering in the direction of pursuing the group norms, right? And you had the differential psychologists saying, no, we're gonna study how things play out in individuals because that variation you're seeing, that's actually the signal. It's not the noise, it's important. Right. Um, we've never really recovered from that. And unfortunately, that makes it very, that, that's a factor that complicates this translation from the lab where we're doing these groupings to the clinic, where you're dealing with individual cases. And anyone who de deals with those cases can tell you a heck of a lot more than I can about just how complicated and unique they are. What we'd like to do is exactly what you're describing. That is to follow people over time. It's just pragmatically right. difficult. So we're I'm in the midst of a proposal now where we hope to follow the transplant recipients at least on an annual basis, right? And we do get uh, clinical, they get great, very rich clinical data on these patients over time. So we know something about how sensitivity and motor control are changing over time, but we'd like to know something about 
how is what's going on in the brain related to that? And again, I want to emphasize, as I feel very strongly about this, I don't care about changes in the brain that don't relate to behavior. That's just not my thing. I mean, I think it's important for people to study those things, but my thing is studying functionally relevant changes in the nervous system that track behavior, right? Because I see those as the most relevant to these kinds of bigger issues of how do we move this stuff toward the clinic. And so hopefully, uh, we'll be able to pull some of that off here. Uh, we may be able to see amputees sooner in that chain of events. At Oregon, we didn't have clinics in, nearby and medical school and so on. So those, are, those are great questions. I mean, we can do our manipulations with the left-handed undergrads, right? But yeah. that's going to give us a slice of things. And so another way of thinking about what I showed you here is, is sort of a cautionary note, I, I, at least I see it, is that, you know, <clears throat> It would be a mistake to assume that something that worked well in those college undergrads is going to play out the same way in those amputees, for example, because they're really differently organized to start out with, right? Wow. You know, just look at the differences when they move a single hand. Um, so we have to be careful about that. So we like to do that because college sophomores are a captive audience, they work for beer money, and you know they're easy to get down to the scanner, and they generally are pretty compliant, and so on. Uh, but man, we have to be really careful about what, how we think about that data we get from those people in terms of how it, it applies out to those patient groups. Sorry, I get a little like all excited. Yeah. One of my issues. Yeah. yeah. 